Well, um, what I want to spend our time with is to think about a question that has been informing my work and that I continue to have questions about going forward. So this is not going to necessarily give you the definitive answer about this uh, framing question, but rather to show you where my thinking and my work has been and where I see some opportunities for the field to go. Uh, so I thought just to make sure that we're on the same page about what I mean by this question about what, what built environment amenities could benefit health. I mean, things that we may put into place and invest in for among other reasons, the health benefits. Um, and so that could be things like food retail, supermarkets, markets or produce sources, walkable neighborhoods or walkable streets, urban green spaces, urban trees. So things that we think could have health benefits. And I think in my work, one of my goals has been to not just take that assumption that there's gonna be health benefits for granted, but to really dig into, you know, do those benefits play out in our empirical work? Do they play out in ways that are gonna help us towards our equity related goals? And what can we learn along the way? Uh, so I want to first share a little bit about what I've been doing uh, and where I've been investing my time and some of the results that we've been getting. Uh, in addition to the work that I've been doing in my own research team, I've also been drawing on some of the, some of the lessons and examples that we had incorporated into a textbook that I had an opportunity to co-edit with colleagues at Drexel trying to bring together really what are the things that we know about urban health and that people should have as they come into the field. It's really what I wish I had when somebody first asked me to do urban health work to let me know what all that is. <laughs> so I'm happy to talk about that experience uh, or some of the things that are in there and how that's informing our education programs like our online MPH and urban health, which is where a lot of my teaching is concentrated now. And then, uh, time permitting, I'll talk a little bit about where I see opportunities to grow the evidence base in ways that are a little bit different from what I have been doing and have been seeing in the field so that we can launch into conversation kind of from that duality of where we've been and where we're going. So I thought I would start with just a sort of a schematic idea of like what a lot of the work in the built environment and health research that's focused on amenities tends to have as a frame. Often we have more complicated causal models, but it kind of boils down to if goods and services are closer by, then we will use them more and that's going to have benefits for our lifestyle, right? And so I, I think as I have been both embracing this view and critical of this view, I think of it as kind of a simple utilitarian, if we reduce the costs of getting fresh food, then people will eat more nutritious meals, have a healthier weight, healthier cardiovascular risk profile, et cetera. If we make streets more walkable, people will walk. So it's, in a way it's kind of simplistic uh, and some of the definitions in the field risk being topological, we define walkable streets as the places that people are more likely to walk. But I think it has been interesting and, and it has attracted attention for potential action that could bring built environment change into what we consider as strategies to promote health and especially for early stage prevention of risk factor development. I want to also say that my work in this field is in part because I find it really interesting to read about. I think getting the right answers about what it is that we can do in these expensive, durable changes to the built environment, that that really matters. If we're going to use health in our justification for making changes, we should have good information to do that. Um, that said, I haven't always believed that the underlying assumptions that are guiding this work are correct. And so I come to it realizing that some of my findings have been perhaps not that strategic in that I end up saying, well, this food environment measure that we've invested in developing, maybe that's not where our attention should be for action. Maybe these urban tree planting initiatives that I've been involved in and helping to advise are not the main place that we need to focus if we're gonna improve air quality. So I, I just wanna highlight that duality that I come to this with 
both trying to understand and see if we can play out the optimistic assumption that these amenities are going to have health benefits on, as a population average benefit. Uh, but also, if that's not the case, we want to know about it. One way that this idea of a kind of utilitarian approach shows up is with a common refrain in public health about making the healthier choice the easier choice. So I, I noticed that that's you know, common in uh, the local state messaging as well. And I think this is very compelling. And what I want to do in my work is to help us understand when this really holds and when it doesn't. And uh, so with that, I want to go back several years to when I had done work on cross-sectional food environment variation, looking at which residents of New York had more access to supermarkets and other uh, retail that we thought would be health promoting associated with a lower BMI. And I had an opportunity to present that work at a council meeting about the FRESH initiative, right? So our work was part of the justification for a tax and zoning initiative that would bring supermarkets into areas identified as high needs. And I think some of the food desert literature has the implication to, to support efforts like this, right? If we have areas that are low income and don't have a supermarket, the solution is bring in a supermarket. And I think while that could work, we don't inherently know that the supermarket is the active ingredient of what we need to address. It could be that uh, that is just more politically tenable than addressing the low income aspect of the environment. Uh, so one of the things that we had an opportunity to do was to write up some of the efforts to bring research and policy together in the New York City environment in this case study. And something I found interesting in the effort to then present this back, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation had had funded some of the work and brought us together with policy leaders in New York City. However, because administrations had changed since the time when the work had been done and presented, they were actually not aware <laughs> of our work or our prior uh, testimony to support some of the changes that they were now in a position to build on and continue forward with. So I think that is you know, one of many cautions that I've learned over time about trying to do policy relevant work is developing the relationships really requires a continued investment and the surroundings that you're trying to inform, the people whose work you're trying to inform can change. Uh, and so that brings a challenge. Some of the work outside of New York City that I think is really interesting and thoughtfully done uh, includes comparative work with new supermarket openings. Uh, Tamara Dewitz and her team has done some really nice work looking at a comparative natural experiment. One area got a supermarket, another didn't, carefully matched. And I found this work really interesting because there was some support for changes in the pathways we'd expect between a supermarket and improved diet. Uh, but those benefits weren't exclusively seen among people who used the new supermarket. And the supermarket was only one thing that changed, right? So that was part of a broader community development effort. And so one of the things that's really been on my mind is when we see these specific natural experiment findings, are we, are we identifying what it is that mattered for health or are we potentially conflating two things, right? So maybe the community development, the investment in the broader environment was the active thing. And if we just say from this, we're going to drop supermarkets into other high needs areas, we may not get the benefits that we anticipate. We may not even get any benefits. So that's some of what has been on my mind as I think about how we can move forward. So I also will say that some of the experimental or natural experiment work on neighborhoods and health focuses on relocating people into new environments. And so that can sometimes mean disrupting existing social networks. And it can mean that if it's into a new, not previously developed community, those are often quite peripheral. And even if they're designed in principles that are supposed to be pedestrian supportive, they may in fact be so far on the fringe of the urban environment that they are have a, have a mixed 
composition in terms of their features and whether they're going to be more towards car oriented or pedestrian oriented travel. So from thinking about these different natural experiments and what the limitations are and the, the potential for us as a field to be making sort of special pleading on behalf of, well, in this instance where we saw a null result from a natural experiment, it's because of specific features of the supermarket, but on average, a supermarket would have had the benefits. Um, I've thought that, that what we need to do is to look more broadly, uh, kind of synthesize the evidence across multiple studies that are like this. Um, and so one of uh, the systematic reviews in the field that I thought was, was really nicely done looked at new grocery store interventions, right? So trying to pull together what's our best evidence from when something has been changed in the neighborhood, trying to bring in something we think of as an amenity, has that worked? Um, they noted that the majority of studies had weak methodological quality, uh, and they made this assertion that it's not possible to conduct randomized controlled trials. So at the end, I want to come back to that because I think maybe we've taken that as a assumption for too long in the field of neighborhood research. So from some dissatisfaction with the cross-sectional studies and the natural experiment literature, I thought, well, I want to then just go big. Right. Let me get data on all the places that got new supermarkets across the whole US. Let me get data on all the places that had hospital closures. Let me get retail change on a scale that can allow us to average out over whatever the special circumstances are that we're seeing in each instance. So working with data from uh, it's sourced from Dun & Bradstreet that's longitudinally harmonized year by year, we uh, put forward, I, I led and R01 funded by NIA that we have called as a team the Retail Environment and Cardiovascular Disease or Received Project. And so that has been work that's ongoing. We now have about 28 published studies. It's taken a long time to fully play out the original and aims from that work. Uh, and we are continuing to do work in, in each of these aims. The aims were framed around the specific parts of the retail environment. So first, healthy food. So focusing on supermarkets and produce markets. Second, walkable streets. So looking at walkable destination density, as well as uh, other parts of the retail environment that are relevant to physical activity like gyms. And then third, pharmacies, hospitals, and other medical facilities and whether the geographic patterning in those affects health. Uh, and in terms of outcomes, we were looking at disparities in access uh, with a focus on racial differences and how those emerge over time, whether they're getting narrower or getting further apart over time, looking at the role in aging in place. So are the characteristics of the environment associated with whether you subsequently move out of that environment? Thinking that sometimes we may distort our picture if supportive amenities keep you from moving out of the environment, then we might end up with some, uh, some challenges to causal inference. And then also looking at cardiovascular disease incidents, so focusing on health risk factors and outcomes assessed in two cardiovascular cohort studies. Uh, the cardiovascular health study, which started with older adults in four sites and has followed most of the 5,888 older adults for the rest of their lives. And the REGARDS study, which started more recently, uh, but is larger, about 30,000 middle-aged and older adults who have been followed, and that's from throughout the contiguous US. So in order to do this work, wh what we decided that we needed to do was to characterize the buffers around the places where people in these two cohorts had lived. And because some of our questions were really about environments and how those had changed over time. We also characterized all the census tracts and zip code tabulation areas in the contiguous US so that we could paint a more complete picture of neighborhood change. And so we, we did that focused on the period from 1990 to 2014. So a 25 year period, um, more than 70,000 census tracts, more than 20,000 buffer areas. So this was a, 
uh, a really fun and challenging team effort that continues on happily. I have got a renewal, so we're continuing on with the work. Um, and I'm happy to talk about where that's going now, but this is the aims that were originally funded. Uh, I wanted to share a couple of the lessons that we had along the way, um, partly to underscore, you know, how disappointing some of our subsequent null results were. So I will just highlight, <laughs> spoiler for the end. Uh, so we wanted to assemble address data, obviously for cohorts to be followed up over time, we carefully monitor the addresses, both the CHS and the regards did a lot to try to avoid dropout from their cohort, sending birthday cards, asking for people to update as they moved, getting medical records. So there were a lot of things that were trying to keep that cohort intact over time. In addition, we had the idea that perhaps as health problems increased, as people got close to death, we might miss some addresses, we might miss some late moves. And so we identified LexisNexis as a commercial source for additional residential history data that could complement what we had from the cohorts. Uh, the linkage to that data required sending LexisNexis, birth date, social security number, things that IRB is very concerned about. In the cardiovascular health study, we were asked to restrict our analyses to those who were already deceased, which as I said, was most of the cohort, but it does introduce bias. So it was not without costs, uh, both the costs of what we paid to the company, but also the cost and potential bias for our study. The LexisNexis personal profile data that we got back was talked up a lot by our vendor, um, but we noticed things that were not what we expected addresses that persisted after death periods at an address that overlapped a lot. So we were not getting this sort of clean residential history sequence that we hoped to get. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that, but uh, Brooks et al. have published some of the findings that highlight limits to the value added. If you already have a cohort with address data over time to bringing in this additional commercial data, um, I think it can be useful if you don't have a credible source of residential history data. Uh, but after all, I think we had some cautions about that that I'm happy to share if anybody's considering it as a data source. Second, we wanted to look at things related to walkability over time. And one of the things that we often incorporate into walkability measures is the intersection density or something related to the street network. Um, many studies that look at what you have access to near your home factor in the distance for walking or driving using street networks to construct a buffer that is tailored to those networks. In this work where we wanted to go back to 1990 and the cardiovascular health study had recruitment starting around that time, we found that the limits of the quality of the street network going back in time kept us from feeling comfortable in constructing a buffer throughout the time period. So this images from one of the studies about constructing a longitudinal walkability measure, where you can see that at the top, where there's a red line, it didn't quite connect, and it would have shown that if you're trying to develop a buffer that you couldn't get through. But the underlying satellite imagery for 1990 versus 2003-04, it doesn't look like that was a real change. It looks like it was a fix in the street files. And so what might not be a surprise to uh, some colleagues who have dealt with the archived street data, we didn't feel comfortable going back all the way to 1990. And so we ended up, because of this, deciding to rely on more radial buffers and those administrative areas, census tracts and zip code tabulation areas. Plus we had a budget cut. So <laughs> we had to figure out some way to absorb that. Uh, so, in addition, once you have a plan for how you're gonna characterize all these addresses that we've collected over time, we've now determined that we're just gonna draw circles around people's homes instead of more complex shapes, then you still have to decide how you're gonna get information over this broad period of time on retail. Because remember, food environment, physical activity venues and walkable destinations and medical facilities were our exposures of interest. So those all came from the National Establishment Time Series data, which uses data 
uh, for those familiar with retail from Dun & Bradstreet. And, and we were able to develop a protocol to improve the geographic, uh, to reduce error, because we, knew, we learned that that had more error in location for early years versus more recent years. And then to come up with a categorization. We did a lot of spot checking, of course, working with data that goes back for decades. We couldn't spot check consistently throughout the time period. We could just spot check using the most recent year. Uh, versus Google Street View imagery, but we felt like we could get to some defensible classifications of the environment and then count up things like supermarkets within each buffer, within each census tract and zip code tabulation area. Uh, I won't stay on this too long, but it's just to highlight that like we had to think through all these different steps, including how we were gonna name things, because once we had 25 years, several different neighborhood definitions. In addition to the NETS data, we kept identifying other data sources that we wanted to be able to control for sociodemographic composition, land cover. Uh, and so we came up with a naming convention that would be uniform across all the variables that we were creating. And what we decided is we would have the geographic unit, the data source, what it was, in this case, supermarkets, we had a three letter codes. What we'd done to it, we created a density by the count over land area, and then in what year. So you can imagine that then you're stacking up, you know, we have these across different years, across different geographic units, across two cohorts, plus all the administrative areas. So we had, <laughs> in retrospect, the need for somebody with more data engineering skills. So I will just share that I think that's something that we need to figure out how to recruit into public health projects and uh, have as part of our partnerships going forward. Finally, we then needed to think about like for any given paper, what were the right restrictions? How did we want to construct things? Um, one of the things that I was really interested in from the beginning because of the analogy to natural experiments was could we look at places that could get a new supermarket so they didn't have one at the beginning and then did get a new supermarket or places that could lose a hospital and then did. So places that started with some and ended up with none. So a couple of our papers have, have done that. We have uh, just published in an American Journal of Preventive Medicine, a paper that I will show in a minute uh, focused on the food environment, but early just describing how the disparities looked over time on the medical facility side was this paper by Jen Sui at all. So all of this then led us to the substantive findings. Of course, we published several things along the way about our methods. Uh, this is still just in press. So we had time varying information for the cardiovascular health study. So that was the group that was recruited starting around 1990. So we were able to update the information about their access to healthy food throughout the follow-up period uh, to as late as 2014. We could start with place, people who at baseline didn't have access to a supermarket and then look at whether they gained access, kind of emulating these new supermarket studies that had been done previously. Uh, so that was one of the like big ideas behind AIM-1. And I will just share our largely, in fact, robustly null findings uh, for the time varying food environment measures. We did see some baseline association, uh, but that was really explained by adjustment for socioeconomic characteristics as many food environment uh, findings I see are. <laughs> so I, I think one of, the, one of the worries that I have is that out of the dialogue around, around food deserts or communities perceiving that they're not getting adequate access to healthy foods, the response is supermarkets are gonna cure it somehow, but I'm not sure that's really a message that then plays out into reducing incidence of you know, cardiovascular disease, of diabetes. Um, a second study, this was not part of the original plan, but I had an opportunity because of all the data that we had assembled. I usually think of the Census Bureau as a source of data, but they actually came to us for data. And so I was able to get special sworn status, work at the Census Bureau using the American Community Survey data. 
I think many of us who do work in the neighborhood space use aggregated American community survey data to get neighborhood characteristics. But of course, there are individual level household surveys that that's based on. And the mortality disparities in American community study links those individual level records to mortality. And we were able to bring in our census tract characterization over time so we could match up in 2008, the survey questions were asked and then national death index linkage had identified the cardiovascular mortality subsequent to that. Um, Norm Johnson is at the Census Bureau, so I got to build a connection there. Sean Altacruz is at NHLBI and had been the one to originally make this connection and, and encourage us to do this work. So no regrets, great team. And I got special sworn status, which is fun. A lot of paperwork. Uh, <laughs> and in the end, we see again, healthy food retail presence in 2008 was not associated with reduced cardiovascular or all cause mortality in our fully adjusted models. And, you know, we had consistency across lots of analyses. I think, you know, we should always be trying to probe our data and see if we've missed something. I think with null findings, one of my strategies has been to turn null findings into a festival of nullness by looking at it lots of different ways. Um, and for better or for worse, they're often robust. Uh, so despite our idea to try getting large sample sizes, so you'll see uh, in the number of participants, that's 2,753 participants. So even if we think these are subtle nudges, right, we should be able to detect them in this kind of a sample size. We also had, you know, all those American Community <laughs> Survey questions about about household conditions and, and economic status, like we were able to control at the household level rather than only at the area level. So, so I think we had very robust control options. Um, and so despite our well-powered, well-controlled adjusted analyses that we thought could detect what might well just be subtle beneficial associations, we haven't seen it. Um, rather than be too discouraging. I do want to say that for some of our physical activity uh, retail supports, we have seen somewhat more promising results. This is one of the studies where we had device-based physical activity measurement in the New York City environment, and we used our gym measurement. I think sometimes questions about effect modification, you know, who's most likely to help us see the association that we're looking for uh, can give us more or less confidence in our starting position. And here we saw that the, the people who said that they had a gym or recreational membership are the ones for whom having a gym nearby was associated with physical activity. So that seemed like reassuring for sort of face validity that we were measuring something real. Uh, other work that we've done on the physical activity side was to look at whether having a more physical activity supportive environment would attenuate the association of income with cardiovascular coronary heart disease outcomes. Um, some of you may have seen in the green space literature, one of the hypotheses that sometimes gets uh, some support is that more green neighborhoods are gonna attenuate our mortality disparities. And so we, we thought, you know, areas that have more green land cover more physical activity facilities, more walkable, like maybe something in that would help everybody to be healthier. Uh, so what that would have looked like would have been to have the more supportive dark green be uh, a weaker association. So this dark green would have been in the other way. <laughs> um, so, you know, we looked trying to separate out uh, but particularly for land cover, which I think has been one of the more popular hypotheses for attenuating cardiovascular disparities. Again, we're like we haven't really been able to support what the assumptions were, which you know just makes me think about the potential for other uh, sources of confounding and, and bias in the work that we're drawing on. Uh, this is just a more complete, you know, not just looking at overall, but with some population strata. Uh, 
I know that some of the work that is done here is, is particular interest in the needs of black residents. And so I just want to highlight like, particularly for black uh, folks in the regard study, which is designed to include black and white residents from throughout the US, uh, we saw a pattern that was kind of a striking dose response in the opposite of the hypothesized direction. So where do we go? <laughs> so I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is like, what do we do with all this work? And I came across this umbrella review that was one of the things that made me worry. So this review said, uh, looking at the different place-based interventions that could improve population health, that those that use less agency, that allow for less agency among the residents could be the most promising for reducing health inequities. And I think, if I think back to that natural experiment with a new supermarket in the context of a broader community development, I found myself wondering if in that work, in other work, building new green spaces, greening lots, if the community process to have agency in articulating needs and gaining resources that help you to address those needs, like far from being counterproductive for addressing inequities, maybe that is exactly where we should focus our attention and give less attention to some of these visible measurable aspects of the built environment where a lot of the work is focused. So some of my takeaways so far have been that the longitudinal amenity increase that we thought would play out into benefits have had at best mixed support for reducing risk. Um, our evaluations do not consistently find expected health and equity benefits. So I don't think we have a good answer to, you know, what should we do in terms of investing in amenities to benefit health and health equity. With funding efforts like the infrastructure fund, that you know, is infusing different kinds of built environment money into states and communities. I've thought about like, you know, what would I say if, if I was given an opportunity to advise on where they should spend the money? And what I found myself thinking a lot about was that question of agency and actually going in the opposite direction from what that umbrella review had recommended and saying, you know, maybe, maybe agency to articulate and meet the needs of your own community is exactly what matters about the built environment change. When I've looked at different pieces of the literature, I'm really struck by some of the natural experiments that are most successful seem to have more community ownership of the change. So I thought I would spend a few minutes, maybe this is a natural breaking point in case there are questions, but uh, the other things that I thought I would just share is a little bit about where to go from here. Are there questions that I should address before wrapping up with that? Okay, great. So, so I, this is the shorter portion, less empirically based, more just where my thinking is. I've been thinking about my own work and how my focus on amenities might put me in a different position in thinking about agency. Um, and when that agency, when, empowering communities to make choices about their own built environment is most likely to matter, how that might have implications for which actions we choose, and then how we might go about seeking stronger evidence. So a lot of our frameworks to help drive the work in neighborhoods look something like this. And what I wanted to point out, I, I really like this Schultz and Northridge. I use this one often, but it treats things that are supportive, that are positives, as structurally equivalent to things that are negative, that are stressors, right? They have the same upstream determinants and downstream consequences and mutual influence. And I've started to think maybe that's not right. Maybe we need to actually distinguish them and notice the ways that they are not symmetric. So when I'm talking about hazards, I'm not only talking about like physical harmful hazards, like uh, 
PM 2.5, but also other things that relate to injury. So traffic hazards, for example, that put pedestrians at risk, other interactions like racially biased treatment that lead to a deterioration of institutional trust, right? So things that are harmful, things that we understand to affect health through harm versus uh, opportunities, right? That we think will have this benefit. Uh, in terms of hazards, just schematically, we think that if you look at places and populations that have more hazardous exposure, they're gonna have more of whatever symptom, whatever risk you're looking at. That might not be with, to the same degree, but we don't think it will go in the other direction. More hazards wouldn't be beneficial. It would be harmful to a greater or lesser extent. And then what I started to think about is, should we actually expect perfect symmetry, right? Should it be that for amenities also, the more we have, the better our health is. And that's a little bit different here and there for different populations, could be stronger or attenuated depending on whether you have a car that can allow you to access neighborhoods other than your own, but it's always in the same direction. Um, there's some prior work that I thought nicely illustrated a perfect symmetry. So this is looking at longitudinal air pollution and greenness change with a mental health outcome. But I think some of the time I actually hear from different audiences that it's possible that beyond a certain point, more amenities would be harmful. This often comes up in conversations that get into gentrification, converting public housing to market rate housing, or otherwise sort of what you might call locally unwanted land uses. Like, you know, that's an amenity, but I don't trust that it's for me. I think it's for some future residents that are gonna displace me. Um, and so I think it's possible that even those, these things that we think of as amenities or opportunities in the environment, the direction of their association will vary depending on the population characteristics. Uh, and so I, you know, in looking for examples of this, I, I saw this paper that looked at perceptions of the built environment usability, which sounds good, right? Like who doesn't want to live in a more usable built environment? Um, but they found actually that depression went up among the most lonely members of the population with increased built environment usability. So I don't know exactly what that means. I think when I've done work that, that triggers this kind of conversation, it's usually trying to pick some change to the environment and the resistance is around, you know, don't price me out of my housing. So what I propose is that there's a dark side that we need to be aware of in thinking about amenities and opportunities. And keeping an eye out for that when we're studying what we could do that's well-intended, I think is really important. I don't think there's what we would consider a bright side to hazards, right? So I don't see people making the argument that, well, we have this toxic exposure, but that's gonna be good because it's gonna give more affordability and stability to the environment, right? So like, I don't think we wanna treat these as symmetric. And I think the implication is that for hazards, we can more readily assume a monotonic relationship. More is harmful, less or more, but that's it. Whereas for, for the opportunities and amenities, I think we have to worry that more is, we hope, better, but we may be making assumptions that residents are more like us than they are, and we may not be understanding the full picture of what they're worried about. So I think from that, the implications are that paying attention to agency perhaps matters more when we're thinking about amenities or opportunities, whereas for hazards, for removing harms, it may be okay to assume that everybody wants that. Also, for pathways that lead to health through changing behavior, through changing how people feel in their environment, through mental health benefits, Agency may matter because how we understand built environment change, whether we understand it to be for us and by us, 
may play out into whether we use it, whether we feel good and belonging in it. And then finally, I think, uh, contrary to the idea that we should give less agency if we're worried about inequities, I think those populations that are primed to distrust well-intended changes to their neighborhood environment are exactly the populations where we need to make sure we're hearing their voice and lived experience. So what I think this has as a lesson for us in public health is to think about arraying the options that we have uh, in terms of how much they're based on restriction, which can be expedient short-term versus making an investment in more deliberative, often slower processes uh, that build autonomy. So I've thought of these you know, for shorthand as being more top down, you know, we impose a change to the built environment versus bottom up, we generate ideas about how the environment could and should change and select them with communities. I'm going to just skip ahead to what I think we could do to build better evidence. I think some work that I've been seeing in the field does bring community voice into a built environment or other health promoting activity, but it's part of a multi component package of activities that is designed to then be evaluated, but then we don't know which piece mattered, right? So if we bring in community voice, we bring in a built environment change, we bring in some other programming. At the end of the day, if we see benefits, we may incorrectly attribute those benefits to the built environment change, when in fact, it could be that the process that was more deliberative was what mattered. So what I'm, what I'm interested in seeing if, if we could create space for in the field is something that would maybe revisit that idea about having randomized trials, allowing matched communities to either get a co-design deliberative process towards built environment change, or just the built environment change that was selected by another community, or a delayed intervention, probably an option, uh, after a delay to choose either of those. So that at the end of the day, what we could do is understand whether the areas that had a built environment change alone benefited with respect to control and whether there was an added benefit of the co-design aspect. And I think I have come from a more utilitarian side in my work of just trying to do big data that is secondary. So as it's a stretch for me to move towards intervention research, but I think we're not gonna be able to isolate the added benefit of community engagement without being able to match the built environment change. And so I, this is what I'm starting to uh, pivot my work towards, trying to figure out how to build capacities in this direction. So my closing thoughts are that I think investing in agency and even if we're doing secondary data, trying to measure something about the process of built environment change, uh, which might include document review, that that can help us to understand some of the discrepancies that we see in the built environment evidence base. And then I have the idea that resources to meet articulated needs may be what matters. So when communities say that they feel they're living in a food desert and they want a new supermarket, if we give them resources to address that, that may be what matters. And putting a supermarket in another community that's identified a different set of needs may not have the same benefits. So I think that really requires a, a pivot in our thinking from, from believing that we're gonna find universal health effects of a specific place-based amenity to thinking about how a process that may create some flexibility about which amenity gets selected by the community could actually have better health benefits after all. Thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to Q&A.